Hello students, in this lecture I will be having a big talk on management of supracondylar fracture of humerus, lateral condylar fracture of humerus, dislocation of elbow and pulled elbow. The purpose of this lecture is to make you aware about the basic anatomy of distal humerus and elbow joint, to make you aware about the clinical findings, diagnosis and management of supracondylar fracture of humerus, lateral condylar fractures of humerus, elbow dislocation and pulled elbow. So briefly talking about the basic anatomy of distal humerus, this is the distal humerus that you will be seeing from the front. This part is the, the medial prominence, is medial epicondyle. Then this smooth curved articular surface is trochlea, which articulates with the proximal ulna, or you can say articulates with the polycranon and some part of the coronoid anteriorly. And this spherical articular surface is keplum, which is actually part of lateral condyle. And this prominence is lateral, lateral epicondyle. So this whole part is lateral condyle, which is consisting of keplum and lateral epicondyle. And this whole part is medial condyle, which is consisting of medial, medial epicondyle and trochlea. And the groove you are seeing here is meant for articulation with coronoid. See, the coronoid is actually having prominent tip. And when the patient is going to flex elbow, this part is automatically going to articulate with this part. And this, therefore, this groove is meant for coronoid. When you are seeing from the back, again, the, there will be a medial prominence. This is medial epicondyle. Uh, you can see the ulna is having a circular articular surface and the olecranon is going posteriorly. So in the terminal part, the olecranon goes in this segment and this segment when the patient is doing extension. So in terminal part of extension, there will be articulation in this area and in this area. And now this groove is meant for articulation with the olecranon tip. So olecranon tip will ultimately articulate with this part in full extension and therefore it is known as olecranon fossa. When you are, this is the elbow joint, when you are seeing from the front, this is art, this trochlea is articulating with the proximal ulna, while the capillum is articulating with the radial head. This is the view we will be getting when viewing from the lateral side, because the radius is on the lateral side, so the capillum will be articulating with the radial head. And when you are seeing from the medial side, the you will be seeing trochle, outer aspect of trochlea, which is seen articulating with the olecranon posteriorly and coronoid anteriorly. So this is the basic anatomy. Now there is bony part, there are some ligaments also, part also, there are some ligaments also which are helping in stabilizing of this joint. So there are medial structures and lateral structures which help in stability of the elbow joint. Now coming to supracondylar fractures. Supracondylar fracture, as the name denotes, the fracture occurs above the condyles. So this part is medial condyle, this part is lateral condyle, so fracture has to be somewhere here. That's why it's known as supracondylar fracture. However, you have to be careful when diagnosing supracondylar fracture in children. Why? Because it is most commonly affecting the children only. And second thing, the children bone is not as mature radiologically as you are seeing here. This kind of picture you will be getting in an x-ray of an adult. However, in pediatric patients you will be getting this kind of picture in a radiograph. Why? Because the ossification centers have not fused yet. However, you will be able to mark, demarcate the olecranon fossa. So this olecranon fossa or coronary fossa you can see anteriorly or posteriorly it will be olecranon fossa, anteriorly it will be coronary fossa. On the radiographic presentation it will be hard to differentiate which one is olecranon, which is one is coronary because this is an anthroposty radiograph. So you can see the lower part of the olecranon fossa or coronary fossa appears to be intact and the fracture line is passing above it. So therefore the medial, sorry this part medial condyle and lateral condyle articular surface is intact that means the joint part which is being contributed by these condyles is intact and the fracture is occurring above these condyles or can occur through the condyles also but the part below the condyles should be intact so therefore this is a fracture line which is passing through the supracondylar region or just transcondylar region so they will all have similar kind of management whether it is transcondylar or supracondylar so most common fracture around elbow in children, 60% is the frequency and 95% are extension type. So if you see your elbow, you are able to perform extension up to 0 to 10 degree and you are able to perform flexion. If the fragment is going back, that means it is an extension type. Fragment means distal fragment to the fracture. So this fragment I'll be showing in the next slides. When it's going back, it is extension type. When it's going in front, it is flexion type. And the most common variety is extension type. Flexion type is rare. So whenever there is extension type of injury, there will be angulation posteriorly and there will be displacement of posteriorly of the distal fragment. And the mechanism of injury is common for all elbow injuries. It is usually fall on an outstretched hand. And it may be associated with other fractures also because, because when the patient is falling on outstretched hand, the injury can occur in any part of the forearm, elbow or arm. So the clinical features will be similar to any kind of fracture. There will be painful swelling around the elbow. There can be bruising. There can be open wound also when the injury is severe one. And there can be tenderness, restriction of movements, deformity, 
and visceral neurovascular deficit also. By visceral neurovascular deficit, we want to highlight that there can be associated brachial artery injury. And as far as nerves are concerned, the most commonly injured nerve is anterior interosseous nerve, which is the branch of median nerve. Now, one can debate why anterior interosseous nerve is getting injured when the nerve is originating distal to the elbow. That means it is a branch of median nerve. So why it is happening? Because of the traction. Because the fracture distracts the median nerve and median nerve now pulls the anterior interosseous nerve which is which is somewhat tethered to the interosseous membrane. So therefore that is the side where failure can occur. Therefore interosseous membrane is usually affected. Then there can be injuries to the other nerves also. Like median nerve can also be injured. There can be injury to radial nerve also and there can be injury to the other nerve also. But most common it is anterior interosseous nerve. In this picture also you can see the anterior part of the arm is prominent while the posterior part of the arm is prominent posteriorly. Therefore, this means that the fragment distal to the fracture has gone back. So this is a picture I wanted to highlight that this is an extension kind of injury. I will be showing the x-ray. So you see, here this is a lateral radiograph, this is an anteroposterior radiograph. In lateral radiograph, the beam has to go from sides of the arm and in anteroposterior radiograph, the beam has to go from the front of the arm. So in lateral radiograph, you can see the distal fragment has gone back. So this is an extension height of injury. And in AP view, we can see whether there is medial or lateral migration of the distal fragment. As far as the classification is concerned, the most commonly used classification is Gartland type. And whenever there is minimally displaced fracture, it's known as type 1. And whenever there is angulation, that means anterior cortex is opened, while the posterior cortex is not, that means type 2. And when there is complete discontinuity of the anterior and posterior cortices, that is Gartland type 3. The type 2 is somewhat stable. Why? Because the periosteum on the posterior side is still intact. So there are chances that the close reduction will be successful and will remain stable with elbow flexion. However, in these cases, Gardland type 3, there is no periosteal hinge left posteriorly. Therefore, it needs to be stabilized with k wire fixation in all instances. And if there is associated vascular injury, suppose you have got a fracture supraphrontal humerus without, with absent pulses distally. So what you need to do? you have to reduce the fracture first. Why? Because, because of the fracture some displacement, sometimes there is stretching of the vessel and sometimes the vessel gets kinked. Whenever these things happen, the pulse is automatically going to disappear. So once the fracture is reduced, then the radial, sorry, the brachial artery will be restored to its original position and there are chances that the pulses will return after that. If the pulses are not returning and however, the circulation has returned, that means you are able to see pink limb capillary ripple is intact, then you have to go for other investigations like Doppler ultrasound. In Doppler ultrasound, you'll be able to make out whether the flow of the artery is intact or not. If it's not intact, then you have to go for higher investigations like CT angiography. CT angiography is nothing but a three-dimension radiograph supplemented with a dye which is going inside the circulation. So there will be demarcation of whole arterial tract in the CT. Then you will be able to make out whether the artery is obliterated, whether it is torn, or whether it is compressed. According to that, you can plan for further amendment with a vascular surgeon intervention. It usually needs open exploration and repair whenever injured. And whenever it is obliterated, it will need prophylactic fasciotomy. Fasciotomy means you have to decompress the compartment. Because every vascular injury is going to result in toxins collection in the forearm compartment. And these toxins will result in edema. And ultimately, the edema will result in tightness of the compartment, leading to compartment syndrome. So the procedure that is need to, that needs to be done for compartment syndrome is fish short. Then they're coming to management. Simple fractures like Gartland type 1 can be managed with splintage in an above elbow slab or cast. Usually when swelling is there, the slab is applied. Once the swelling gets reduced, then cast can be applied. Slabs covers the splint on one side of the arm or forearm, while the cast covers the limb circumferentially that means there will be layer of plaster on each side of the forearm while in a slab it will be only on the one side either anterior or posterior then whenever there is minimally displaced fracture close reduction and splint can be done whenever the fracture is majorly displaced like guardline type some fractures of type 2 and of type 3 then we need to reduce it close in a close manner and put k wires for fixation in some cases when the close reduction is not successful then open reduction can also be done and i've already told you about the vascular deficit part that needs to be investigated and intervened accordingly. Now, how will you tell whether the reduction is adequate or not? So there are some radiological mic markers which can be used intraoperatively with to assess whether the fracture is reduced correctly or not. So there is Bowman angle, this alpha angle, which is actually the angle between the capitular physial line. 
here we have capillar physal line we had seen in previous radiograph you can see this line this is capillar physal line this line and the line between the diaphysis of the humerus the angle subtended will be called as Bowman angle usually this angle should be 64 to 81 degree or average you can say 72 degree and this needs to be restored within the normal range or best thing is to get an x-ray of the opposite side and restore the Bowman angle according to that so that there, there are no minor or major variations in the angle then there is in lateral view we have to check the lateral capital humeral angle it is usually 40 degree so it is an angle which is subtended by the line passing centrally through the capillum and line passing centrally through the diaphysis the angle is usually 40 degree so what about the neurological deficit suppose the patient is having a nerve injury also in a closed supracondylar fracture then we have to wait for three four weeks because in a closed fracture we have to assume that the injury is a neuropraxia one that means functional conduction in the block and it should recover within three to four weeks and if there is no recovery then we have to go for higher investigation like nerve conduction velocity and electromyography electromyography will tell the denervation potentials being generated inside the muscles while now conduction velocity test will tell whether there is block in the conduction complete block in the conduction or not if there is no conduction then nerve exploration and repair has to be done so the method of close reduction of supramandal fracture needs to be stressed upon because this is a common fracture in elbow and you may be asked about the method also so there usually there is requirement of three assistants one will pull the arm one will pull the forearm so that the fracture side gets restricted and the major assistant then will try to perform flexion and while pushing the olecranon this olecranon from posterior to anterior why because the fragment just which is attached to the olecranon had gone posteriorly so we have to push it anteriorly so while pushing that we have to perform flexion and when we are doing flexion more than 90 degree we have to check the pulses also if the radial pulse disappears at flexion more than 90 degree we have to bring back the flexion to a reduced extent at a point where the pulse is present and we have to splint the fracture in that particular position and then above elbow slab is applied so this is a radiograph which is slightly different from the radiographs we have seen in previous figures so anterior anterior posterior radiograph you see there is migration on the lateral side while this lateral radiograph do you see something different here you can see the fragment which was earlier going post really is going in anterior direction i told you whenever it is going anteriorly there is flexion kind of injury so this is a flexion kind of supracondylar fracture and whenever you are dealing with the pediatric distal numerous fracture, you need to be aware about the Salter Harris fractures classification. It is very simple. You need not to remember any mnemonic. Just remember you are going from a simple thing to a complex thing. So the simplest thing will be the physial separation. Here you can see whole of the physis is in discontinuity with the proximal part, that is diaphysis or metaphysis. So there is complete separation. And in this part, second type two. Also, there is complete separation of this epiphysis. However, it has a metaphysal fragment also. So therefore, this is type 2. And in type 3 and type 4, you have some part of epiphysis which is in discontinuity from the proximal bone. So some part is still intact. Again, as in type 2, you saw that there is a metaphysal fragment. So therefore, in type 4 also, there will be a metaphysal fragment. So it's simple. Epiphysis, epiphysis with metaphysal fragment some part of epiphysis and some part of epiphysis with metaphysal fragment and last one severe one injury the diagnosis is made retrospectively because it is not evident in earlier radiographs this usually occurs because of the compression of the physis now physis is not visible on the radiograph means that it is visible as a clear space so whether it is compressed or not at the time of injury you will not be able to make out immediately so if the patient will bring uh, her, his or her symptoms later on that there is shortening of the arm or there is deformity of the elbow because of the growth disruption of the damaged physis. So some, if some part of the physis is affected, there will be deformity. And if whole of the physis is affected, then there will be chances of shortening also. Another important thing you need to be aware in distal humerus fractures is the ossification centers. Now, pediatric elbow does not have all anatomy like an adult bone because the ossification centers either have started appearing or are yet to fuse. So you need to remember the important ossification centers, which are for capillum, radial head, medial epicondyle, trochlea, olecranon, and lateral epicondyle. So you have to remember this order 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. And the mnemonic is CRITO, C-R-I, that's I for internal epicondyle, that is medial epicondyle. Internal is medial, right? Trochlea, then olecranon, and external epicondyle, that's lateral condyle. So they start appearing at this time, and they usually fuse by 12 to 15 years. Just remember 12 to 15 years for most of them. However, the medial epicondyle usually fuses at a very later stage close to the adulthood so just remember for other it is 12 to 15 
and for medial epicondyle, it is almost at adulthood. So why are they important in pediatric elbow fracture? Suppose you have got a neonate with this humerus fracture. Now, in neonate, none of these ossification centers will be visible. So in a radiograph, you will be clinically you will be seeing a fracture, clinical findings, but on radiograph you will not be able to see anything. So what will you do then? We can just say that there is some distributed structure, but we will not be able to comment whether it is displaced or not. If it is displaced, then it needs reduction definitely. So we have to perform an investigation called arthrogram. Here what we do, we inject a radio opaque dye inside the joint, then get a radiograph. Now what happens, the dye takes the shape of the articular surface, which is not visible in the radiograph. And the articular surface is made by nothing but the epiphysis. So automatically, automatically it is taking the shape of epiphysis. So like in this figure, you can see, there is structure of lateral condyle or capillum which was not evident on the radiograph because the capillar physis is still to appear. But on arthrography you will be able to see there is whole bony block which is translucent, not visible in the radiograph. So this patient underwent an open reduction of the capillum. Now coming to lateral condyle fractures. So supracondyle fracture line will pass somewhere here, so lateral condyle fracture line will pass somewhere here because it is involving the lateral condyle and capillum. Capillum is part of the lateral condyle. So there will be lateral epicondyle, there will be capillum. The clinical findings will be similar to any fracture around the elbow joint. And usually it is the second common injury of the elbow joint after supracondyle fractures. And 15% is the incidence. Again, the mechanism will be similar to supracondyle fracture that is fall on an outstretched hand. Symptoms will be similar. And however, the neurovascular deficit is uncommon because usually the it is not a very high energy trauma. Whenever lateral condyle is fractured, it is not usually a high energy trauma. Supracondyle can happen in very high energy trauma. But rarely, this is not an exception, rarely these things can happen. A high energy trauma can sometimes be associated with a lateral condyle fracture also and in those scenarios there can be neurovascular injuries also but there is no specific common pattern with these kind of fractures. Now the diagnosis will be made clinically on the basis of tenderness, swelling, painful swelling on the lateral aspect along with there will be bruising etc. And the diagnosis is confirmed by anteroposterior lateral radiograph. However, you have to be careful here. In lateral condyle fracture, sometimes the fracture line is difficult to demarcate on anteroposterior radiographs and lateral radiographs. Therefore, we have to get an another view. So this is one place where we need three radiographs. An oblique view is also required. Sometimes the fracture line becomes evident only on the oblique view. Classification is given by Milch type. Milch type is type one. Whenever the fracture line is involving some part of the lateral condyle and some part of metaphysis, so this will be type four. We have, to, we have seen in the sort of classification, in some part of the epiphysis and some part of the metaphysis is there, then it is type 4. However, in type 2, you can see that there is some part of metaphysis and, and whole of the epiphysis of the lateral condyle is affected. So there will, this will be type 2, so metaphysis and whole part of the epiphysis. We are talking about only the epiphysis of lateral condyle. So don't get distracted by the epiphysis of the trochlea. We are not dealing with it. Classification is for lateral condyle fractures only. Therefore, it is salter hair is type type two in this part. So type four is type one, type two is type two. Type two remains type two when salter hair is concerned. Classification then can be delineated according to the displacement, whether the fracture is displaced or not. And whenever the fracture is going here, the, I told you this part articulates with the proxima ulna, or you can say olecranon and coronoid. So this, if this part is compromised, that means there are chances of elbow instability or dislocation also. We have to check in the, all these patients whether there is some elbow dislocation or not because dislocation needs to be reduced immediately. Otherwise, they will put strain on the neurovascular structures and sometimes ligaments also. Then the management will be similar to supracondyle fracture except for the part that this part is actually inside the joint. I told you, epiphysis is the part which is actually contributing the joint. And whenever the fracture is involving joint, the reduction should be perfectly anatomical. And anatomical reduction uh, in an adult bone can be achieved by indirect means because we are able to see the radiographs intraoperatively and we can see whole of this articular surface subponder bone inside in, uh, the surgery. But in pediatric fractures, I told you that they are, uh, there are ossification centers. These centers do not mark it at the actual joint line. The actual joint line will actually be formed by very thick cartilage which will not be evident on radiograph. Therefore, it needs an open reduction. So all lateral condyle fractures should be reduced in an open manner whenever they are displaced. For non-displaced fractures, we can call the patient every one week, then get a radiograph to see whether the fracture is displacing or not. If it's not displacing, then we can wait and with a weekly follow-up, 
we can treat the fracture conservatively also that is without surgery using an above elbow slab usually four to six weeks of plaster is required why it is slightly higher than the supraventral fracture because this is an unstable injury whenever the fracture is involving the joint that automatically becomes unstable therefore the period of immobilization slightly increases then coming to elbow dislocation it is usually common in older children not common in early age group clinical features will that most common variety is the posterior dislocation rarely there can be anterior dislocation and sometimes depending upon the ligamentous and bony failure like fracture in a fracture there can be posterior dislocation in medial direction and posterior dislocation in lateral direction whenever there is failure of the lateral ligaments then there are chances of posterior medial dislocation while medial ligamentous failure will result in posterior lateral dislocation however whenever the bony component is concerned suppose there is lateral condyle fracture then there will be chance of posterior lateral dislocation because the bony column tells which will be the direction of dislocation if it is failing on the lateral side there will be lateral dislocation and if it is failing on the medial side there will be medial dislocation however ligament part is different medial structures will prevent the lateral migration while the lateral structures will prevent the medial migration so you have to be just confirm you have to just confirm which direction the elbow is moving it is meeting moving medial lateral if it's not associated with fracture then there, there are chances of ligament as failure on the contral upper side that is medial or lateral common mechanism of injury for all elbow injury the fall on outstretched hand but variable mechanisms can be there like direct impact on the elbow can also result in dislocation again the sign findings will be similar to a fracture there will be painful swelling motion restriction and the forearm will appear short and why because whole of the forearm has now migrated posteriorly posteriorly so it will appear somewhat short and there can be associated brachial artery injury or median nerve radial nerve injury also in these cases the more another important clinical finding is the disruption of the three point bony relationship if we flex the elbow in 90 degree and draw the medial epicondyle lateral epicondyle and the tip of the olecranon so they form an isosceles triangle if this point moves here that means there is there are chances of proximal migration of ulna because of the dislocation so that will be a uh, that has to be compared from the contralateral side and whenever this point olecranon tip is moving somewhat here proximally there are chances of dislocation or this can happen in an olecranon fracture also and the finding will be tenting of the tricep in tent you see there is dome then there is curved part then there is part for holding the ropes of the tent so the tricep will appear like a tent so there will be tenting of the tricep why because the olecranon is the part where the tricep is inserting now olecranon has moved backwards and proximally so the tricep's tone automatically gets reduced so it will appear excavated like a tent and if there is shortening in the arm then it is a sign of supraconjunctival fracture why because arm is shortened that means condyle has mo moved above while whenever there is shortening of the elbow that means there is short elbow dislocation because forearm has migrated proximally so this you can see this is tenting however in the normal image you can see there is curved contour which is not evident in here so this is normal this is tenting of the triceps now radiographs will confirm the elbow dislocation findings dislocation means there is no continuity between the joint so the coronoid which should lie here is outside this space and olecranon which should lie here is outside this space ct scan can be helpful whenever you are having doubt that there is some associated fracture or not like in this figure you can see there is a fracture fragment also which is lying anterior to the distal femurs so we have to see which fragment is this whether it is coming from the lateral condyle or which is coming to the like medial condyle so the ct will be helpful because ct is nothing but a three dimensional radiograph management will be close reduction under sedation or anesthesia and brief period of immobilization by brief because if it's prolonged then it will result in stiffness stiffness means excessive development of fibrous tissue around the elbow which will prevent the motion of elbow therefore two weeks is sufficient for cases which are not helpful with close reduction we have to perform open reduction on the elbow joint and usually it occurs whenever there is associated fracture or ligamentous failure we have to repair the ligaments also in those situations and the period of immobilization can be increased in case of the ligament repair but some motion has to be started early to prevent stiffness uh these are the images which show the close reduction maneuver what you need to it can be done in a supine position or it can be done in a prone position the main thing is that you have to pull let me section then you have to flex then pull the forearm in a in the direction opposite to the dislocated because dislocated posteriorly you have to pull anteriorly if it is dislocated anteriorly it will have to push posteriorly then coming to pulled elbow or not smeared elbow why not smeared elbow because it used to be implicated in earlier times that it occurs because of the mishandling by the nurse maids because of the pull of the forearm so very common in toddlers why because the ligaments of in this age group are less so what happens it is not a dislocation actually the radial head 
coming out of its original place and the annular ligament which is actually circumferentially covering the radial head along with ulna proximally that gets entrapped between the radial head and the capilla so therefore the supination movement gets restricted the child will come like this in a mid prone or pronated position and not allowing to flexion extension and supination so there will be history of a click being hurt there will be the child will be keeping elbow flex painful supination will be there and radiographs are usually not required however ultrasound can be done whenever the rate there is doubtful findings like we are not sure about the history and the x-ray is normal then you can go for ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis of old elbow it will tell there is some ligament being lying inside the radiocapillar space so close reduction has to be done what we need to do we have to quickly supinate we have to quickly supinate and then flex this will bring the radial head back to its original position and the interposed ligament will come to its original position no more immobilization is needed now coming to complications of subprochnoid fracture these are important complications that can occur in subprochnoid fracture compartment syndrome can happen because of the excess swelling and sometimes because of the vascular injury i told you and then whenever the cave fixation has been done there can be displacement of the cave wires pin site infection can also occur cubitus vas deformity is a common deformity which can occur with subprochnoid fractures it is also known as gunstock deformity why because the four because the elbow takes shape of the gunstock this part is gunstock then there can be cubitus valgus when there is inward bending of the elbow it's sorry inward bending of the elbow and outward deviation of the forearm then cubitus decurvatum why it occurs when the fracture gets malunited in extension so there will be extension at the elbow joint hyper extension normally it is 0 to 10 degree extension can happen but hyper extension it is more than that tardy ulnar palsy can also occur because of the late onset of the fibrosis which trap the ulnar so earlier the ulnar will be intact however with time it will get neuropathy then there can be vascular injury told you nerve injury and elbow stiffness most important thing elbow stiffness in subprochnoid fracture usually resolved in 4 to 6 month and early mobilization has to be started whenever the fracture gets united complication of lateral condyle humerus fracture there can be elbow stiffness again which is fracture related and with time it will should resolve then there can be delayed union why because the lateral condyle if it remains displaced for a long period the vascularity of the lateral condyle gets compromised if it is compromised then automatically the healing will be affected then non union can also occur it is not reduced in normal position cubitus valgus can occur why because if this fragments get displaced then automatically the radial head will go above and when radial head will go above it will deviate forearm will deviate outwards and elbow will go inwards <coughs> so there will be cubitus valgus deformity tardy ulnar palsy can occur but it is caused by stretching of the nerve not because of the fibrous entrapment suppose this segment this segment is going laterally the so automatic nerve which is lying here is going to be stretched then avascular necrosis of the lateral condyle can occur you can see this part is getting necrosed this part is sclerotic and there is sharp demarcation because this part has lost vascularity fistula deformity can occur because of the vascular compromise of this part which is lying between the lateral condyle and trochlea at the time of fracture then lateral condyle overgrowth can also occur in some cases because of the stimulation of the vascular supply then there will be excess there will be excess of bone formation in this area only lateral condyle growth arrest can occur according to high energy trauma and there will be associated elbow deformity because of the abnormal growth of the physis and sometimes there will be arm shortening also whenever the whole of the condyle remains hypoplastic in complications of elbow there will be stiffness i told you early mobilization mobilization has to be started hypertrophic aspiration can occur because all the capsular attachments are actually attached to the bone whenever they are evolved the osteogenic cells cover whole this area and they perform actions like a fracture healing and bone formation is there so abnormal bone is forming in an abnormal space the vascular injury can be the, occur, uh, there then compartment syndrome can occur as with any complicated elbow injury repeat dislocations or laxity can occur when there is major ligamentous injury or major bony failure which as can occur when lateral condyle fracture or medial lateral condyle fracture which are actually providing attachment to the ligaments thank you